Hey everyone, welcome back to the Leadership Locker. This is your host, Rich Cardona. Look, and this is a place if you are a new entrepreneur or if you are considering entrepreneurship. And I bring on guests like my guest today, Jay Kelfer, because they eat, live, and breathe trying to enhance your ability to elevate yourself as an entrepreneur. Now, if you go to Jake's website, jakekelfer.com, or if you go to his Instagram, you're going to see he's been featured in a lot of places, ESPN, Sports Illustrated, ABC News, Forbes. You're going to see pictures of him with athletes, with the big baller brands, with Magic Johnson, you know, Mike Trout, Tommy Lasorda, uh, who passed not too long ago, you know, and he's worked with some fantastic programs, including the Trojans. I'm a Trojan. He's worked with them. He's worked with Syracuse, the Gators, which is oh, hard for me to swallow because I'm a seminal, but oh, well, if you take anything away from that, it's he knows how to insert himself where he needs to be. And he is just incredibly big on building relationships, but in a capacity that benefits life and business. Okay. It's not just about business. Now, also, if you go to his Instagram feed, you're going to notice that he goes live pretty often and that he's full of energy. He's just like, let's get it. Okay. He's all about us, you, me, him getting exactly what it is that we want out of our respective journeys. So although he has a fantastic past working with athletes, he's also an author and he is on the show because his new book, Elevated Entrepreneur, is out and it's free. Okay. There's not a lot of people who make books and make them available for free. And in this book, as you'll hear, he interviewed 39 people, took him a hundred hours to do. And it's all because he's combining what he knows and what they know to give you the lessons you need. So this kind of altruism is hard to come by. And I'm really, really thankful to Jake in the podcast. He'll tell you where to get the book make sure to pick it up. Um, and I believe that after you hear him, after you listen to him, you're going to know that this person means everything that he says and he wants you and I to succeed. Let's get into it. All right, everyone, welcome back. You just got the intro on Jake and I'm super happy to have him on. Uh, things are going well in so many different ways from including the book launch, which of course we're gonna get into. But Jake, can you please tell us a little bit about yourself in your own words, even though I hooked you up in the intro? Yeah, man, well, first of all, man, so great to be here. I'm excited for this conversation. A little bit about me is, you know, I've always been this person that wants more, right? I've always been this high performer. I've always been focused on it. And so my entire life, when I was younger was I wanted to play in the NBA, like straight up, like that's what I wanted to do. But as a five, eight Jewish kid from the suburbs, those dreams quickly dwindled, you know, by the time I graduated <laughs> high school. And I was like, well, if I can't play in the NBA, let me at least represent the best in the NBA, you know, because I had parents that made me focus on academics as well. So I was like, well, let me use my brain to then represent those players. And if I can't wear the Jersey, I'll wear the suit and be on the court next to them. Right. So I went to college. I, I tried to go down the sports agency route and everything's going well. I'm going to the networking events. I'm meeting all these people. I'm interning at all these amazing agencies. And right before I graduate, my last semester at USC, the agency says, we can't hire you. They went on a hiring freeze. And I'm there and I'm like, oh my gosh, like for the first time in my life, this entire plan of going, 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 getting to the level that I thought I was going to get to, just it flipped it on its head. And then the panic sets in, right? Because USC is a pretty expensive college, right? And so I started thinking like, I'm going to graduate thousands of dollars in student loan debt, and I'm not going to have this job. And now I have to figure out what to do next. So when these moments happen for anybody in our lives, there's, there's that feeling of like, well, do I take what's easy? Do I take the easy route? And just get the simple paycheck? Or do I like dig deep and figure out, well, what's the move that's going to get me closer to the way I define success and to what I really want? So I turned down a bunch of other jobs because I was like, I'm not moving to Philadelphia. I'm not moving to Sacramento. I'm not going to work and do, do different things. So I was like, I need to figure something out. I ended up graduating college without the job with the hope that the Los Angeles Lakers would hire me. Fast forward a couple months, I start my career not on the court as a player, but I start my career on the court as an assistant to the corporate partnerships division for the Los Angeles Lakers. And that was like the first time where I realized life isn't always going to go according to your plan. But what is about to happen is you get to choose when that happens, what are you going to do? And so it turned out to be a great blessing. But while I was there, I realized I was made much more so for the entrepreneurial world than for the corporate world. And so I ended up writing my first book at 23. That led me to speaking all over the world. I built my MBA combine that's helped over 70 guys sign their first contract. That led me to my second book. 
And now as we've continued to build multiple businesses in different industries, my main focus is on helping people build online businesses and helping coaches and experts write their first best-selling book. So now that's the process. And now, of course, we just released book three. So the journey has been ever evolving, but there's always been this mentality of what could I do more? How could I help people? And how can I use my knowledge to make a difference in the world? Dude, that is an amazing story. And uh, yeah, it was just a couple of weeks ago. It was the three-year anniversary of Elevate Your Network. So that's awesome. Congrats. And I'm so happy about the new book, which we'll talk about. But I want to hit something you said. I'd love that there's no coincidences anymore in my life. And it's not a coincidence that number one, I just discovered we went to USC. So that makes sense. Number two is that you said there's always more. Well, look, man, like I, I already told you in the intro, I was like, ah, you know, my office isn't set up or my studio, so to speak. And I've been thinking about my studio and I was like, I want to get like one of those neon signs. I just want something that's going to sit there that people could see and, and know that's what I'm about. And I settled on there's more. There's always more, man. Like there's always more. And I think it's so interesting that at such a young age, you were just like, you had this massive roadblock. There were just like, this isn't going to happen the way you expected. You pivoted in a major way. You're on the core of maybe the most prestigious franchise in NBA history. And then you still decide that like, there's more. I'm going to do the riskiest thing I could possibly do. And then I'm going to start helping people who want to do the same. Now, one thing I want to say uh, before we continue on is that I mentioned to you while we were warming up a little bit is that the show is going to pivot. Well, the show is pivoting in a way where it's going to be rebranded. And if you're listening, you now know it's going to be the midlife entrepreneur because I'm a midlife entrepreneur, man. Like I, I was in the Marines forever, did Amazon, and then I was like, this is bullshit. And I am now an entrepreneur and I want people like you and me to help others who are, you know, kind of middle-aged, so to speak, realize like, I can do this. So if we, anyone is in this position and maybe someone is anticipating that they're not going to necessarily want to stumble all over the place uh, trying to figure out how to start a business or maybe how to coach people with their prior experience and they want a coach, like, let's first talk about pros and cons of coaching business coaches. There's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of incestuous masterminds out there. There's a lot of craziness out there. What are the pros and cons of having a coach? Well, first of all, there's a lot of greatness and there's a lot of garbage. What we have to identify as, as people who are going through this is, well, let's cut through the bullshit because there's a lot of people that put out fake promises or they, they promise something and they under deliver. There's also sometimes a lack of knowledge it's easy to be sold on the headline and the marketing tactics. We live in a world that's very much quick fix marketing, but unfortunately, business and entrepreneurship is a long-term game. And so sometimes what we see is, is when some of the biggest mistakes are, we go for the quick fix, we go for the over-promiser, we go for the, the shiny object, we go for the person that's way too far ahead of us and can't relate to us at that part of the journey. That's a really, really big thing. Sometimes the biggest names or the people that like you always hear about might not be the person that can best serve you at the level that you're at. And I was guilty of this too because I started trying to do the strategies of the people that I looked up to. And the problem was, is I didn't have the back end processes and systems. So by investing in their programs, I wasn't getting the material I needed at that moment as a beginner. I was getting the material that I needed, you know, six figures down the road to then be able to implement it at the right speed. So those are some of the things to like really watch out for. But then some of the pros, I mean, I think investing in a business coach and just investing in yourself in general is one of the greatest things that we can do in our life, right? The fastest way to get to the results you're looking for is to find someone who's done what you've done and to have them share with you how they've done it. Now, What's really important here is not that we take everybody's information and try to do it all. You have to focus in on one or two people that you really, really, really resonate with, same values, same morals, same processes, same energy, and that way you can go all in and be able to really develop and cut through the noise as fast as possible. But I think overall, man, I think, I think investing in yourself is so key. So look, you, you mentioned something about the shiny objects and some of the bigger names. I have to second that in such a major way. I've fallen victim to that. And, and <laughs> there's a, one of my commanding officers used to say, you're either a predator or you're prey. And I was prey for the beginning of entrepreneurship. Now I get it a little bit. The point I want to make, and I'd like you to hit it a little bit more, is that the people 
who are the big names are so, we are so far removed from the amount of experience and from the proximity to them themselves. Like we are investing in their brand, but not them. That person is not going to sit and have one-on-one -on -one calls with you. You know what I'm saying? Like that person is not going to dive into your business unless you have astronomical amounts of passive income that you just could throw fucking money around wherever. It's not going to happen. And, and not to say anything about coaches who are a little bit less than that, but like if there's someone five, 10 steps ahead of you that's a little bit closer, you will probably get exactly what you need versus all the shiny objects that you're seeing. So, so what is your take on that? Like, you know, you know, now you don't want someone who's a huge name, but then there's small names. And that could be like that, you know, not enough experience at the same time. How do you kind of delineate where that right qualifications or experience may be? So here's what I'll say on this is like those big names, they're big names for a reason. They're good at what they do. They're awesome people. They're amazing. They're talented, right? They have the following to back it, the proof of the concept, the experience. They're as legit as they come a lot of times. Now, there are still some that have just kind of been along the ride, rode the coattails, and then became their own person. But a lot of these big names I really respect. And I wouldn't say don't listen to them, don't learn from them, and don't invest in them in certain ways. But you need to make sure whatever investment you're deciding to make is good for you at the stage that you're in. So if you're in the beginning and you have the option to spend five or $10,000, are you going to go to a one weekend mastermind with the big name or are you going to do a three to six month program with somebody who's, you know, four to five steps ahead of you instead of a hundred steps ahead of you? Now, this is a really, really interesting decision to make. Depending on your budget and depending on what you're willing to do, it can make a big difference, right? I believe that ultimately though, no matter what you do in investing in yourself is that it's the relationships that you build that'll get you ahead of the game faster. It's all about the relationships. So if you go to certain events, like if you're looking at the biggest names, go to their events, meet all the right people, so you can get you closer and then make your bigger investment when you have additional capital. Most of the time, capital is one of the big blocks for people to invest with some of the bigger names. But I, I think there's a reason that you should get to that point to be able to do that. Now, the question that you asked was related to, well, what about someone who might not have as much experience, but they're still, could be really good. How do you, how do you like differentiate the like newer people on the block or the people that aren't like overly well known? Well, I kind of equate this to like the agency world in sports. And I'll, I'll give a quick example. There are some of the biggest agencies in the world. Everybody wants to be recruited by them to be signed by them because they're the biggest names. The problem is, is you don't get access or your agent has 20 other clients that they're taking care of. So how do you get that attention? Smaller agencies, what they can promise you is maybe they don't have as much experience, but they will do everything they can for you to have the success you want. So this is the same type of thing when you're looking at business coaches is, what is in alignment with who you are as a person? Do you want to be one in a hundred or do you want to be one in 10? Do you want more personal attention or do you want to be part of a larger group? What avenue do you really want? And then you have to figure out, am I going to get access to the actual person? There are a lot of group programs out there and coaches that you get into their program and you see them once a month or you don't even ever see them and they have their team of coaches. There's nothing wrong with that because their systems and process are so good. But if you want access to the actual person, you have to make sure that you do your due diligence. And so what I say to anybody when you're investing, and I do this myself as well, is I always try to talk to the, per to the coach that I'm looking at, right? Depending on the level of investment, I'm always trying to talk to the person that I want to learn from because I want to learn from them, right? And so I think it's really important that especially when you navigate the roads, especially because there's so many coaches, there's so many people in, in the space and trying to come online, the barrier to entry is really low. You have to do your due diligence beforehand. What testimonials do they have? Do your energies align? Do you have commonalities and background commonalities? Are they on the path that you want to be on? Do they have a network of people that could potentially lift you up as well once you go through their program? And how can you really make sure that they're the right person for you? Well, you have to follow your gut. You have to trust your gut rather than trusting the marketing and the promises. I agree. I mean, I think it's this is it for anyone starting out, whether it's a coaching business or, you know, what, whatever type of business it is, there is going to be a point where you're literally starting from scratch. And, and these people, people in those situations, uh, I don't want to say are, are not, not desperate for testimonials or anything like that, but they are absolutely in intending on over delivering. So that way they could start getting not only the reps in, but get the feedback they need from you and maybe some of their other clients that could help them fix their systems and processes or their styles. So I think you're dead on with that. Now, I would agree also on the bigger investment with the bigger names is a networking play for sure. Like it's, it's 
it's less about learning because I think sometimes like, look, I've been to a lot of events where I'm like, I see something on social media. I'm like, I saw that at the event as well. I'm like, some of it's like kind of recycled, but I met these three key people and that's a really big deal. So the book you wrote three years ago, Elevate Your Network, talk to me about your stance on networking. Obviously, it's a huge part of this, uh, but talk to me about networking when you're starting out or you're kind of pivoting and, and like going to launch a business. Well, let me make something very, very clear. You are in the business of people. And you will not grow your business if you don't have customers, just like you will not have a romantic relationship without another human being, right? <laughs> now, unless you're into some weird shit, you know, like that movie Her or whatever, but like, you, you know what I mean is like, we're in the business of people. And the way that we treat people, the way that we help make people feel, and the way that people perceive us is going to be the difference of, can you grow your business? Can you accelerate your business? And who can you learn from and get access to at the best rates or at the best speed. And so for me, everything that I did in that book was designed to help people build better relationships in life and business. Focusing on the strategies, which are important, but more so focusing on the person because people come first. And I'll be honest, we all have an objective when we're networking with somebody. We do. But if that objective is the priority, people will cut through the bullshit and they'll see that. So the objective is a long-term game, but the immediate short-term game is, can I build a relationship? Can I build that trust with somebody else? Can I help that person feel like they're the most important person in the room? And here's what I'll say is you want to try to give someone what I call the feeling of elevation. We all have these friends in our lives, these people in our lives that we interact with them, whether it's five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you leave that conversation and you're like, let's go. I'm fired up. This person is awesome. And you want more of them. You put a smile on their face. Maybe they ask you questions. Maybe they actually really listen to you. That's what you want. That's what you want to create, the feeling of elevation. So networking, relationship building, foundational piece. It's how we build our businesses. It's how we teach people to build their businesses. And I think it's the ultimate way to achieve true freedom and fulfillment. Now, we are in a place where, unfortunately, the pandemic is still a constraint. And as a matter of fact, you guys in LA just got uh, the mandatory vax, I think. So the Lakers and all that, like they're going to have the same problems the, the Nets are having right now and the Warriors are going to have or whatever. So it's not necessarily like conferences are back and in-person networking is uh, all a go again. And, and the reason I mentioned this is because if you go on your social media, if anyone goes to Jake's social media right now, you go live three times a week, I believe, or more. You are all over. You are consistently providing value. You're making reels. You're using the platforms the way they're to be intended. Talk to me about the ability to network virtually through maybe organic content or just maybe hosting groups or anything like that. The pro of networking virtually is there's unlimited potential. You, and you can do so much so quickly because you don't have to actually move. All you have, the only thing you have to move is your thumbs and your fingers, right? Like that's literally all you have to move. You don't have to travel. You don't have to get on a plane. The con is that that option is available for everybody else. Meaning what we've seen is a major, major uptick in people doing outreach. But here's the difference. So many people do outreach the wrong way. The people that do outreach the right way are very effective. And I'll share with you how we could be really effective here because in my book, The Elevated Entrepreneur, some of these people with hundreds of thousands of follows, I cold DM them and got responses within a couple hours and got them into the book doing interviews. People are accessible. We, we sometimes think like, oh, if they have a certain amount of followers, they're not accessible. Oh, they have this much money in their business. They're not accessible. People are accessible. You just have to know how to access them. And so when we connect virtually, you know, it's really important that you know that there are a million other people reaching out to the people you want to connect with. If we can know that, then we can realize, well, then I have to figure out a way to be different. So when I decided to create this book and really dive in and try to get some of these people to be part of this book, some of these really big names, I was like, well, how can I get access to some of the best in the world? Well, most people write articles. Most people do podcasts and podcasts are great. But I was like, I need a no brainer that like, they can't even like think about it. So I said, I'm going to write a book and that's going to be my ask. I'm going to feature you in a book that I read by thousands. Like, like that's how you get in front of somebody. The more uh, practical way though, is you have to know who the person is. If you are networking without intention and you're going purely for numbers, you're never going to be that effective. You'll still be successful. You'll still get relationships because numbers do work. But I want you to be intentional. I want you to be efficient because I don't want you wasting your time. 
I want you to have more time to do the things that you love with the people that you love. So when we do reach out, we are very intentional and effective. So intentionality is super important. And the way we can be super intentional is if you're intentional, that means you know who you're reaching out to. That means you've looked at their content. That means you've researched them a little bit. When you're outreach, mention their name, mention a commonality, give them a compliment, ask an emotional triggering question, and then open the door for future communication. When you do that, you can break through because it's so easy to tell the people that are just like spamming all these really, really all the people that they want to get in touch with versus the people that take the time to curate the right messaging. Now, if you want to get so advanced on this, and I'll leave you with one more because I'm on a roll here. I'm just feeling it, Rich. You got me fired up. Is think about the timing when you're reaching out to these people. If you see that green dot like on Instagram and you see active now, boom, you got to hit them because people are checking their inbox. And if they're getting 20 DMs every two hours, well, you got to make sure how am I going to be at the top? And that's where the follow-up also becomes so important. So there's so many tips and tricks here to really connect virtually, but those are just some that I like. I wanted to bring to people's awareness. We are cut from the same cloth, my friend. Uh, the, the, the manner in which you've kind of procured some of this talent for your book, which we're about to get into, is the same way I use podcasting. I can't wait to ask you some of the things you learned, but I use this as a mechanism to be a conduit for people to learn from people like you, from people like JLD, from Pat Flynn and Dory, all people I've interviewed as well. And it's great. Like, I'm so glad we know some of the same people. Like, that tells me so much about you. But you don't have to have a show just to try and get these people. But like, if the intent of the show or the intent of the book is to literally serve then I think they're going to be able to resonate with that. I think they're going to be uh, a little bit more keen to take the opportunity to talk to someone who DM'd them, took the time and was intentional about it and be like, oh, great, Dory, your book's coming out, The Long Game. I'd love to talk to you before it comes out. You know what I'm saying? Like, hello, it's a no-brainer. So anyway, I love that. Now, you spent 100 hours interviewing 39 people. Uh, I already mentioned some of the names, Ben Newman, Dory Clark, Pat Flynn, John Lee Dumas, some really, really fantastic people. My first question about the book, which is out, is what did you learn through this process that you didn't know before? I learned so many things, man. I, I, I learned so many things. Right? Like, like I learned that no matter what vision you have, the path to getting to that vision is always going to change. So when I started this book, the idea of this book was to interview people to understand the differences and the commonalities of what makes people successful and happy. I interviewed a rabbi, I interviewed a dean of religious life, I interviewed a random stranger that I met on a plane whose daughter won American Idol in Iowa. Like, it was nuts, right? And that's where it started. But what it became was a book by entrepreneurs for entrepreneurs, really focusing on how do we become higher performing, productivity crushing, and freedom achieving. And it didn't start that way. And I think that what I learned really was that, and this has been a theme in my life, but it really came through in this book is that we can have all these ideas, but if we never take action, nothing's going to, nothing's going to happen. But when we do take action, oftentimes that action is going to lead to results and opportunities that you couldn't have predicted before you took that action. And so for me, the people that ended up in this book, the 39 people, like when I started this book, I had no idea that some of these people were going to be in the book. But through connecting and introductions and DMs and the way the world was, like if I did this next year, I might have a completely different group of people. But that's what's so amazing. So that's something that I really learned. Another thing that I really, really learned from all of the guests is that no matter how big you are, nobody knows what they're doing until they've done the work. And this is something that is like, you know, seemingly obvious, but so many of us try to just shortcut our way. We try to read just enough and then just hope that we're going to get that. We try to just build the course and hope the customers will come. We try to start the business and just say, I'm here. Come on in. The doors are open. But until you actually put in the work, nothing's, nothing's going to happen. And so that was another really big lesson is like most of us don't know what we're doing until we've done it. So you got to be willing to try things, make mistakes, do all these different things, because then once you have experienced it, you document it, you create the system, you write out the process, and then it's re uh, repeatable. And when it's repeatable, then you can continue to grow and move on and elevate as you go through your life. So those are two things that like, I really learned amongst many, many others. But those are two really big things that like really have resonated with me um, throughout this process. So I was in the middle of 
putting out fires, so to speak. And it was talking to my YouTube guy. He was looking for the video because it was in the wrong folder. I was getting hit up by my friend Heather uh, about a sponsor that approached us for our podcast NFTs for newbies. I was trying to upload a podcast that I had just finished completing, and I was getting ready to record my introduction and my mid-roll and outro. And then my video ops person, my video editor, my primary video editor wrote me back and saying, how do you want me to do this, this, and this? And I realized like, I don't need to do that anymore. I'm going to just delegate that. And you can only delegate if you have people to delegate to. And if you have people to delegate to, you better have them full time and you better have them for $10 an hour full time. And they should come from Rocket Station, who is the sponsor of this podcast and the reason I am able to delegate. And it's a reason I have people to handle social media, to handle processes, to handle operations, to handle the podcast because I don't wanna get in the nitty gritty with all those things because the inevitable little fires that are gonna pop up, there's some that I'm gonna to have to do myself and then there's the rest of the things that I need to be doing that are income producing activities. And the only way I could generate more income is by spending some of my income on delegating to the help I need. So if you go to Rocket Station and you are ready to dismiss $10 an hour tasks, to someone who can help you for $10 an hour full time, then go to Rocket Station and check them out. Also, they're gonna give you 25% off of your process mapping if you mention the Leadership Blocker and Rich Cardona, which should be a huge benefit to you. So if you wanna go and get in touch with them, go to, you could email brooks at rocketstation.com or you can go to landing.com rocketstation.com. If you want to have a conversation about them before you even commit to anything or before you even have a conversation with them, hit me up. DM me at Rich Cardona underscore and I'll tell you everything you need to know. Now you've worked with athletes and you've worked with entrepreneurs and you've worked with just people who need coaching. And, uh, you know, again, these, these seem like loaded questions, but it just never gets old because everyone's perspective is a little bit different. What have you seen is the thing that maybe, you know, the, the people making that U-turn in life and wanting to start a business or start that course is the part that they skip, that everyone always seems to maybe skip or is just like doesn't necessarily pay enough attention to. And it's, it's, it's actually carries way more weight than they think. I'll tell you exactly what people skip because this was this came through in the book. It was, it was very obvious what everybody skips. Everybody just tries to go to the fast lane, right? We forget to read the, the trainer manual and we start driving the car. <laughs> yeah. The trainer manual in this situation is a question that you have to ask yourself, which is what is my definition of success? What is the direction I want to go? And what am I willing to do to make that come true? Because what happens here in life when anyone's trying to change is they want to get to that next level. They want to achieve some type of result. But if you're aiming for a result that's not in alignment with what your definition of success is, you're not going to win. You're going to start to compare and then you're going to start to question, are you made for this? And then those limiting beliefs are going to be able to overpower you because you aren't moving in the right direction. So what's really, really important is what is your definition of success and what is it going to take to get there? And then as you dive deeper in, well, what does exactly that look like, right? Because you have to play your game. You can't play someone else's game. You have to play your game. Give yourself the best chance of winning that game and that comes from not comparing yourself to others, not feeling guilty because you do it a different way than others, realizing there's more than one way to winning at the game of life, and then making sure that you're willing to do whatever it takes to make your definition of success your reality. Because here's the truth. Some people make a change and they go into entrepreneurship because they want to make a million dollars. Awesome. That's incredible. I love that. Good for you. But some people get into entrepreneurship because they want to create supplemental income so they can take care of the kids and be home uh, at dinner time and not travel as much. Amazing. Is either one right or wrong? No, they're both right. But if you try to do the same strategies for both of those goals, you're going to end up in the wrong place. So you need to figure out what is your definition of success so that then you can figure out what are the action steps to actually make that real and keep your mind above water in that process. I have a comment, man, and and I'd, I'd like you to weigh in on this. Like I said, I know a lot of the people that you've interviewed, and one thing I've learned through podcasting and, and some of the quote-unquote bigger names is that the definition of success never started with how much money they could make. Although entrepreneurship has a proverbial, you know, endless limit of potential and financial gain, 
I mean, there's plenty of them who did not use that as actual measure. It kind of ended up happening. And for the people who did go after the money, you can execute to a point where you make a lot of money. You could just be in execution mode, not visionary mode, and you could execute, execute. And what I learned was some of those people said it was until they had a lot of money that they realized the money didn't matter as much. Uh, so I'm, again, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with a money mindset or an abundance mindset, of course, but as far as money being the driver, have you noticed that some of the happiest people you know don't reflect necessarily on you know, making money the primary goal? Yes. I think that we should strive to make as much money as we possibly can. I, I'm, not, I'm with you. Right, right, right. Which is, I know it's what you're saying here. But I think that I think that while we're pursuing whatever the achievement is, we need to focus on the fulfillment. And this is one of the questions that I ask in the book is, I ask, how do you relentlessly pursue success, however you define it, while also finding time to enjoy the journey and the process? Yes. Because here's what I think is that so many people are, are achievement driven when we begin entrepreneurship. That achievement could be getting a company to a certain level. It could be getting a certain, building your team, a certain amount of customers, a certain amount of revenue, whatever the goals are, right? Those are the metrics that you're using to measure if you're hitting it. But if you're only focused on those, you're never going to have enough. So it's really, really important that while you're pursuing those, that you're finding ways to enjoy the process, that you're finding ways to be fulfilled by serving others, practicing gratitude, and really becoming one with yourself in this, in this, in this journey. Because I know way too many people that have focused on the system, the process of the money that get burnt out. And then they come back, they go through and they say, okay, well, my new way of doing this is, yes, I'm still going to make a lot of money, but my health and my wellness comes first. You got to ask yourself, what is my priority on this journey? And let's just say, I believe you could have it all. Like I believe you could have the money, the fame, the success, the happy, I believe the relationships, you could have it all. All right. And I want everyone, let's listen to this, to go get it all. Like you deserve that. Let's go get it. But if you were to ask yourself this question, would I rather have a million dollar business or would I rather be present for the relationships that I care most about in my life? I'm taking the relationships 10 out of 10 times. The issue here is that our actions as entrepreneurs are often aligned with the money and the thing that gets pushed to the wayside is the relationships. How many people are so focused on the business, their work and everything, and then the thing that gets pushed is, oh, my relationships. I'm not going to make it home for dinner tonight, but I'll be there to tuck you in. I'm not going to make it home for date night. We're going to need to reschedule. Well, what is the priority of why you're doing this in the first place? For me, I put family time, friend time, me time on my calendar before I put my meetings in because my priority, my priority, when I said, when this is all done, what's my priority? It's to live a life doing what I want, when I want with who I want. So that needs to come first. That being said, my business is taken off and we're going to the moon. I'm going to be one of the biggest names out there. Like that's a fact. And I just believe it. But in the process, I'm going to make sure I enjoy it. Because I don't want to miss out on what's what's important. And so like that's that's kind of how I think about that. And, and a lot of the guests in the book, they really dive into this achievement versus fulfillment, this idea of pursuing success while also enjoying the journey. So the name of the book is Elevated Entrepreneur. So talk to me about what you see. What What is the definition of an elevated entrepreneur, so to speak? So I have an entire page in the book dedicated to what is an elevated entrepreneur with all of these, these things. And, and I'll, I'll even read a couple yeah, of them to it, you just because I... I, you know, I could paraphrase, but like, let's get the, let's get the good stuff in here. So there's about nine things that, that make an elevated entrepreneur, an elevated entrepreneur. So an elevated entrepreneur is someone willing to try, even if success isn't guaranteed. An elevated entrepreneur isn't afraid to go big, despite of the fear of being judged. An elevated entrepreneur is willing to do whatever it takes because a life of, oh, wells is better than a life of what ifs. An elevated entrepreneur isn't afraid to ask for help and be vulnerable. An elevated entrepreneur invests in themselves even when it scares them. An elevated entrepreneur pursues their definition of success relentlessly regardless of what people think. An elevated entrepreneur enjoys the journey of today while creating the greatness of tomorrow. An elevated entrepreneur takes action to build a life greater than themselves. And the final one is an elevated entrepreneur is a champion of their own life. That's what an elevated entrepreneur is. That is a beast of a list. I circled one though, man, and I have to get right into it because um, this is very aligned with coaching. The asking for help part. You may be so enthusiastic about the pursuit. You might be relentless. You might have the work ethic. You might have the grit. You might have all of it. And at the same time, dude, you and I both know it. 
Like, it's like, it's like coming in from the grocery store. Like, you don't want any help with the bags. I'm going to try and put 50 bags on each hand, right? You don't want help. Talk to me about the pitfalls you may have seen about people who don't ask for help and how it may actually slow down the trajectory they could potentially have by not necessarily just investing, but literally just reaching out and asking for an olive branch. I mean, this is such a difficult conversation, right? Because we have so much pride in what we do and we have so much love for what we do that sometimes we're like, I need to do it on my own. But I'll give you an analogy here is if you are overweight and you want to lose weight, are you going to wait till you're fit and jacked before you hire a trainer? No. You're going to hire the trainer because you need them to help you lose the weight in the first place. If you could do it on your own, you would have already done it. This is how we live life. It's sometimes we, we have our ego saying, no, I can do it. I can do it. But we don't make the change. We all know what we need to do, right? More times than not, we know what we need to do. We just, for some reason, don't do it. We know that we shouldn't eat the extra, the extra steak when we're already full because it's, gonna, it's not good for us. But we still do it anyways. It's very easy to say no. It's very easy to say yes. So sometimes our mind just says, well, what do I actually want, right? What we have to realize though, is that when it comes to all this, is that you got to decide what's right for you. You got to say, this is me. This is what I want. And I'm willing to do whatever it takes to get there. And whatever it takes is asking for help. And here's one of the things that I think is, is really in the coaching and entrepreneurial world is we think subconsciously or even consciously that if we ask for help, people will perceive us as we are not as good as we are promoting ourselves to be. And because of that, we're like, well, if I ask for help or if I am vulnerable and open, then people are going to say, well, oh, well, maybe he's not as good as we think he is because his marketing says, oh, he's got this business, but he's asking for help. Like what's wrong there? But the truth of the matter is, is that we have to ask for help in order to get to the next level because you don't know what you're doing until you know what you're doing. And the way to know what you're doing is by asking for help. And the minute I've started asking for help has been huge. It feels like a weakness, but it's a strength. And you know what? Like that's when you start to look around at your network for anyone that might actually have those thoughts. And that's when you're like easy target to you can bounce now. Like I'm, I'm on some different shit. Uh, I'm on the people who support me. And, and look, like, look, come on, the law of reciprocity is in full effect here, man. Like if I reach out to you after this podcast and I'm like, hey, man, you know, I've talked to these people, but I've always been trying to get so and so you think you might be able to help me out with an introduction and you help me you know I'm going to lay down in traffic for you next time you need something. Like, it's just the way it is. But let me talk, let me ask you, when's the last time you asked for help? Like, where were you stumped? And you're like, shit. And you asked for help and you're like, all right, uh, I need help with this launch or I need help with this business or I need help uh, closing XYZ deal. I ask for help every single time something comes up that I don't have an immediate answer to, dude. Like, like I'll ask my dad, I'll ask my mom. Now, who you ask for help is very important, okay? I wanna, I wanna make this clear. You don't just ask your family for help on something they've never done or they, have, they don't have any experience in doing. My, my dad's an entrepreneur, and so I talk to him about entrepreneurial things. I ask him questions whenever I need some help. I ask my mom things about relationships. Like she was a adjunct professor at USC, taught in the School of Social Work. She had her own practice for 25 years. When I need relationship help or feelings help or emotion help, and I need to be vulnerable, I go to her. She's got the best advice out of anyone I've ever seen. Find the people that are the best in your circle and ask them for help. And that's the beautiful thing of having the network. So when I'm getting ready to launch my book, who are the people in my network or what books are available? Even if you don't have somebody, well, ask the question and then find the solution. We have to think about what is the actual problem so that we can find the best solution. It's not always just asking a person for help. It could be asking Google for help and finding the right resource, right? But when it comes to people is I'm asking help on everything because I know that I don't know everything. And I'm tired of trying to figure it out on my own. I am at the point where I want to, I want to speed up so I can make a bigger impact on this world. Facts. I want to elevate more and more people, but I'm not going to be able to do that all by myself. So I need to ask for help. Hey, have you ever used this software or platform? Do you mind giving me a quick 15 minutes and we could talk through it? Hey, you know what? I know you just hired this first employee and you, and you moved from, a, from an LLC to, uh, and you're now taxed as an S corp or whatever, right? Like, can you talk to me about the difference pros and cons here? I talked to an accountant, right? The fastest way to learning is by getting information. The way we get information is by asking good questions. The way we have to ask good questions is either you got to pay for the time or you have to have the relationships to be able to ask for their time. But all in all, man, I'm asking for help all the time, man. And that's just part of the game. I'm going to ask you for help at the end of this and I'm going to ask to help you at the end of this recording. It's just what we do. We're always focused on one 
How can I ask for help? But also, how can I make sure that I'm always helping others? So that way you're never feeling like you're always asking for things, but rather you're always in a place of give, give, give. And when you have a genuine relationship, you can ask for anything because you have that relationship. The stronger the relationship, the easier to ask. Yeah, I mean, like you you say conversations equal conversions and a conversion does not necessarily need to equate to business per se, right? 100%. Did you just get smarter by giving, by having a conversation? Like, let's say you're like, hey man, um, I got a friend who's got a question on a podcast and then I help out in that capacity or something along those lines. Like, did you just get smarter because you might've heard something that you haven't heard before as a technique for some really good growth? If I come to you about some business coaching or scaling from this to this or maybe an online course or f- fuck, writing a book, it's like, okay, man, like, tell me, dude, I don't want to make a ton of mistakes. Like, do you have a little bit of a blueprint? Like, dude, I, I mean, that's just that's just the way it works. Conversations equal conversions. I, I could not agree with you more. Now, when we were talking a little bit earlier, you did some traveling not too long ago and I saw a picture. I always like to go to a post from the person's feed a year prior and you were in Florence, Italy, which is my favorite country to visit. Oh, dude, I spent a lot of time there. But, but you talked about traveling and getting to see people. How did you establish these relationships? And I mean, this is crazy. We're just obviously going to stay on this topic, but you were able to maintain relationships across the world and to do traveling. And that has to be, I would say, part of your definition of success as well. But tell me about the trip and what you were doing. So that trip was to Florence, Italy. That was my second time going there. It was my birthday time. And I was like, I need to get out. I need a trip. So I went with two of my good friends and and we just had an amazing time. One of them had studied abroad in Florence. The other one, we had just been there before and we had you know met some people. So he had some connections. We had some people and we just got out there and we just had a great time. And, and part, of, part of me is like, when I look at what do I want in my life, I love to travel. I mean, I think, I think most of us really love to travel. So, but it's like, you got to go to places that you want to go to. And you can't wait for the perfect time to go to them. Sometimes you just got to say, screw it. I'm going for it. Here's what it's going to cost. Let's do it. Let's budget it. Let's execute it. Let's go. And so we did that trip and that was amazing. But just recently I was in Croatia. I'll piggyback off this a little bit further is just recently I was in Croatia for nine days. And if you've never, if you're listening and you've never been to Croatia, I highly recommend it. It's, it's a beautiful combination of old history castles with a lot of Island and beautiful water, great weather, amazing people. And literally one of my goals, when I went in there with my two buddies, we go out the first night and I was like, guys, my goal for tonight is literally to meet five people from five different countries because it's a very big tourism place. And literally that night, I easily hit it. I had people from all over the world that we had connected with. Fast forward a couple more days, we're going on a bus tour, we're meeting people, we're, we're in one location for three nights, we're in split for three nights, and we're meeting people all over the, all over the place. That night, we didn't just go out with the three of us, we brought 15 people that we had met from this last three days for our final night into one bar. And we spent the entire night at that bar drinking, cheers in people from Ireland, from England, from the States, from Germany, and all 15 of us at like the entire top part of this bar. And we're just playing drink games. We're having the greatest time ever. That was one of my best memories, even though we're just hanging out. But it was like the fact that we had brought these people together. That was so amazing to me. And so for me, it's traveling is fun, but it's about the people that you go with to enhance the experience. But then it's also about the people that you meet that can create the holy shit. I can't believe this actually happened moments. So you mentioned something. Sometimes you just got to go do it. And that obviously applies a lot in business. There's a quote I heard not long ago or read somewhere that says words to this effect. Sometimes what must be done eventually needs to be done immediately. When it comes to business, And, you know, we've talked about relationships, we've talked about education, we've talked about investing in yourself. What must be done immediately? Things that will move your business forward, period. It's not the things that keep you busy because busy is different than productive. And this is a very big pitfall that a lot of us fall into. We think the more our calendars filled up, the more successful we're on route to becoming. Not necessarily. Hold on one second, dude. I want to tell you something really quick. I was a dude in the beginning who was, I I literally, I think I used to take screenshots of my calendar and be like, look at all this shit I'm doing. And I had it all color coded. And now, dude, it's five items a day. 
and they better be income producing activities. But anyway, like you're so right. There is something that makes you feel good that all that activity does not necessarily equal action. And I just wanted to admit to my audience, like, dude, I used to be that guy. And, and he's exactly right. So I'm sorry to cut you off, man. But I was like, how can I not share that? I'm like, it's, I'm not embarrassed about it. I learned from it. But yes, go ahead. It's a, no, it's a great, it's a great point. And I, and look, I think like it, the reason we do this is because a lot of times the things that we think are going to move us forward are the ones that are a little bit easier slash they're the ones that have the least amount of chance to be rejected. Meaning it's very easy for us to spend time building our website, creating our program, signing up for this software, learning how to watch the modules on this software, you know, doing things like that, creating a hundred different social posts, doing graphic design on Canva, right? Like it's, it's, those things are important, but oftentimes we do those things because we can just do them and we could say, oh, I'm, I'm checking things off. Like I'm making great progress, but then we forget, well, how many, how many people have you talked to this week that actually could become customers or that could actually tell you what you should actually be spending your time doing? And it's such a powerful thing there because, and I think the truth is, I think the reason why we do this, because I've been guilty of this too, is that those activities are not just easier to do because they still require hard work, but there's no fear that you will be able to put your effort in and be rejected. But the minute you say, it's launched, I'm live, Let's have a conversation. Do you want to join? Can we talk about this? Now you've exposed yourself to criticism, to vulnerability, to people saying yes, to people saying no, to you actually having to deliver on the work. When I was writing my first book, I was so scared because I was like, what if I put this first book out there and everyone criticizes it? And part of me was like, well, maybe I shouldn't put the book out, even though I just spent all this time writing the book. That's what happens is, is we get so caught up in this idea that, that once I do something and I actually start to talk about it and do it, it's out there. And now I'm open to the criticism. I'm open to people saying no. And nobody wants to be rejected. And that's why I have an entire chapter in the book dedicated to how to handle rejection as an entrepreneur and how to reframe it because this is so important. When you can get over the fear of the rejection and realize that it happens to us all, you can then start to move forward and saying, well, I need to start focusing on the things that actually make me money, the things that actually make an impact in the world. What do those tasks look like? And like you said, you put five things on the calendar. I do my top three to five priorities every single day. Those are the things that must get done. And if those get done, it is a great day for me. Everything else is a win. And so I think it's really important that we identify those. And, and I'll be honest here. I don't always get my three to five top priorities done. I get distracted, right? I'll get stuck on a social media loop, even though I've put time limits on. It happens. But I also sometimes on my priority list, I put something that's completely unrelated to business, but it's about my filling up my own cup, taking care of my body, doing my push-ups, because I know that that's going to help me be better at the business activities. Because I need to show up, right? I need to be ready for us for this hour. I need to be like on my A game. You and your people deserve that. But if I don't take care of my body before and I don't wind down, I can't be like that for you and for your people. So I think that this is like a, a really great topic um, for people to just like be honest with themselves. Where are you at? Are you doing it or are you not doing it? And Ben Newman in the book, he asks a question. He tells everyone, at the end of the day, when you look into the mirror and you look at yourself, can you honestly answer the question, did I do it or did I not do it? And if you say, yes, you did it, mazel tov. Congratulations, what a day. And if you say, no, I didn't do it, don't beat yourself up. Ask yourself, why? Why didn't I do it and how can I improve? So, so it's just, dude, it's so powerful. It's such big stuff. And it's once it clicks, it clicks. For that reason alone, everyone should make sure they go pick up a copy of The Elevated Entrepreneur. I believe you have just like the exact right eye on entrepreneurship. I feel like you are going to serve I have so many people. I feel like you are going to get it. Um, and I mean, get it is exactly what you want. But don't forget the fact that there's 39 experts that are interviewed for this book as well. So pick it up for sure. But where can people find more about you, follow you and interact with you? Best place to find me right now and interact is on Instagram at Jake Kelfer. Slide on in those DMs. Let's get some good convos rolling. Always down for it. And uh, the best place to grab a copy of the book is the elevatedentrepreneur.co. And what we've done for this book, because the mission is to elevate people to achieve success, is we made this book free. So you go to that website, the elevatedentrepreneur.co. You can grab a free copy. All we ask is that you cover the shipping and we'll get it to your door right away. Um, but that's what we wanted to do because it's bigger than just ourselves, right? That's what makes an elevated entrepreneur, someone who's greater than themselves. So that's what me and my team did. And we're excited to bring it to the entire world. 
That's crazy. I did not know that. Uh, so thank you so much for spending time with us. Uh, thank you so much for all the hard work that you've done to help entrepreneurs reach a level of elevation that's going to you know, help them just sustain the journey because we all know it's really easy to just get off the highway, uh, but that's not what we're going to do. Not people like you and not people like me. So thank you so much for uh, donating your time here today to my audience and we'll see you soon. Absolutely. Thanks, man. All right, everyone, definitely, definitely check out Jake. Check out The Elevated Entrepreneur. Check him out on Instagram at Jake Kelfer. Check him out at jakekelfer.com. And don't forget about what we talked about in the mid roll, okay? You do not need to be doing $10 an hour tasks. And you know what? It doesn't even matter if you're a business owner or not. If you need someone scheduling flights, if you need someone managing your calendar, if you need someone helping create content for you, then go to rocketstation.com and check them out. Otherwise, look, thank you. Those people, by the way, Rocket Station, are the reason that I'm able to go and do the things I need to do and find the guests I need to find and go and fly to them and spend time with them and edit. All the things that make this podcast worthwhile to you as a listener is because of sponsors like them. So thank you so much for listening. If you know someone who's interested in business coaching or needs to hear some of the, you know, some of these lessons that Jake talked about in terms of transitioning to entrepreneurship or pivoting from a career and entering business, then please share it with them. Let that person know. And look, if you want, leave a rating and a review. I'll be super happy for that. I will see you next time. 